Okay, everybody. Yeah, um, very brave of you to be here after a long day. Um, so I'll try not to keep you too long. Um, but it's very nice to have a chance to um, talk about this stuff. Uh, so yeah, so um, when Amit and the others suggested that I, I, I talk about something, I thought, well, well, what could I talk about that kind of brings some threads together from some of the things that we've been talking about here, uh, and particularly today, which is, this has been sort of molecular sort of simulation day. So um, I chose some work that we've been doing recently. Well, actually, not seriously. It's a long story, actually. It begins almost 10 years ago, and it's still going on. So it, it's not, you're not going to see something that's cut and dried. Um, but I've chosen it because, actually, in the course of it, it illustrates, um, I think, three separate types of slightly unusual or different, anyway, uh, molecular simulation technique, all applied essentially to the same project. So I thought for that reason, it might be a little bit interesting, a little bit different to talk about. So anyway, that's what you're getting. So um, yes, so the, the t it's all about basically our investigations over the ten, last 10 or so years into understanding um, a particular problem in their names out, but it this has been over the years quite a, a big team. Um, a whole load of people from my own lab and the guy in, in dark there, Kevin, he's the guy who's done a lot, lot of this work. He's just left me now. In fact, he's now working for um, uh, a, a software, a, a molecular modeling software company. So he's done quite nicely for himself. Uh, then it's also been a collaboration between myself and my very, very good friend, uh, Sarish Mystery, who's a, a medicinal chemist who also works at the School of Pharmacy at Nottingham. And um, some great pharmacologists as well that we have, uh, Gillian Baker and some of her team as well. Uh, this is a rather nice thing about being, as a computational scientist, being embedded in a pharmacy department, is that it's a very multidisciplinary environment. And there's nothing more nice than if you're working as a computational scientist of being able to interact on a day-to-day -day basis with, with wet experimentalists. And, and we have a chance to do that. And I know a lot of my colleagues often work in chemistry department. In the UK, the computational science is, is very often in chemistry departments rather than in sort of bio ones. And, and they often find it much harder to, to make those kind of interactions with experiment that, that I've been able to do. And I must have I'm very grateful for that. Uh, and yes, uh, again, over the years, we've used a vast number of different sorts of high performance computing. Uh, in fact, one that isn't on there, but which we have should, probably should be, is Exceed as well. We've also had time, uh, thanks to collaborators in the US as well. Um, but yeah, we use everything. Cloud, European high performance computing, uh, funders in the UK as well, uh, local machines as well. Wherever you can get it, we'll use it. Okay, so um, I'm sure everybody here knows about beta blockers. So remember, these are basically... Uh, antagonists, the molecules that antagonist the action of adrenaline on beta receptors. So if you think about adrenaline, what adrenaline does basically it sort of pumps up your heart, gets your blood racing, etc., fight or flight. And the aim of antagonists such as propranolol, this is the classic drug, is to basically try to antagonize that and just basically calm you all down. But in fact, they are enormously useful in a whole range of um, if you like, syndromes, diseases that basically associate with, if you like, with, with overstimulation of the heart. And as I say, they act on the beta adrenoceptor that's there. Uh, and that's really great. Um, but there is one problem with these class of drugs. And that's basically for those uh, patients who suffer from diseases like chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And the reason for that is that these people have basically sort of compromised lung function. And there's also a large sort of preponderance, if you like, of beta adrenoceptors in, the, in lung tissue. And basically, if you, if you antagonize the beta adrenoceptors in the lung, this is really bad news if you've got COPD. And the problem is, is that a lot of people who've got COPD have also got some of these other problems here. So you've got a large lot of people who could benefit from the beta blockers who basically they're contraindicated for because of their, their lung, lung function. But there are potentially ways around that because by chance, the subtype of the adrenoceptor that you found in the lungs is different from the ones that you find mainly in the heart. So the heart is mainly beta one and the lungs are beta two. Now, 
that's good news in a way, but the bad news is that pretty much all the current medications, beta blockers that we have on the market, do not select actually between beta one and beta two. So, but you can see that if we could get one, if we could get a ligand which was a selective antagonist at beta one, we could have a new class of, of, of beta blockers which had a much greater safety profile and had a whole new sort of category of patients much in need of these medications that they could be used for. So this is something that you know, we didn't discover. It's been around and known about for a time. But we have a particularly strong pharmacology team at Nottingham and a long history of working with G-protein coupled receptors, which is what the beta adrenal receptors are. And so this has been a focus of research at the School of Pharmacy in Nottingham for, uh, for a long time, uh, long before I should say that I got in, involved with this process. Um, so just a little bit more about this. Uh, What's rather lucky for us as structural biologists is that the uh, beta adrenoceptor is one of those few G-protein coupled receptors for which we certainly now have a large amount of structural information. There are many crystal structures available for beta-1 and beta-2 adrenoceptors. Uh, more coming along. It was, one of the it was basically the first one that was ever really solved. Um, so this is, they pretty much always look the same. That's one thing. We have quite a lot of them, but they, they don't differ very much. This is kind of a sort of a cross section through the, uh, the, the protein. It's a seven transmembrane helix protein, but I'm not really showing those helices. I'm showing a sort of space filling pic picture, and I've kind of sliced it vertically through there. Um, the sort of browny color is where the membrane would be, and this is, would be the extracellular water. And there's a bit down here you're not seeing, which is the sort of intracellular side of the protein, and then the, obviously the intracellular aqueous environment at the bottom. Um, so basically what you see if you slice the protein is that there's the ligands all bind, the agonists and antagonists all bind in this site which is deep within the, the center, the core, if you like, of this, of this protein, but which is accessed through this channel that leads through basically to the extracellular side, passing through this sort of rather large but not enormous area which we often call the vestibule. And uh, the way in which these ligands bind in their, in their receptor binding site it is always the same because the, all these molecules are, have the same key ethanolamine core structure to them. And that interacts really strongly with two key amino acids that you find in the binding site in this region, which is an aspartic acid, which is on, on, on helix three and an asparagine on helix seven. And these form these lovely pair of sort of bifurcated, sort of charge-assisted hydrogen bonding interactions with the protonated abine and the, and the alcohol uh, function that you've got there. Uh, and this is basically completely conserved really uh, amongst pretty much all the ligands that we have, which we know which binds strongly to this receptor. And, and they really sort of pin it in, in place very strongly. Um, so anyway, as a result of the, of the way that these ligands all are all pinned to this site by these interactions, and, and because of you can see that the shape of this cavity, you can see basically that it's really constrained in this region. But we're just showing one particular antagonist. This is actually a, a ligand called uh, pindolol uh, bound in that site. And what we see when we look at the structures of, of known antagonists is they're nearly always the same. What we see really is that this, on this side, if you like, what we call, what we call, might call the left-hand side, the side is the, that's closest to the ethanolamine of the, of the ethanol, key ethanolamine core, the, the, sorry, the, the alcohol of the ethanolamine core. This group R1 is nearly always compact, nearly always aromatic, and, and really doesn't vary very much, because that's the bit that's got to sit over in this, this little pocket here, and there's not much room there. On the other hand, at R2, you see an enormous variety of large, wobbly, variable stuff, because that basically can just snake its way all the way up into the vestibule. So there's lots of room for diversity there that that's, could be accommodated and still give the, the key binding interactions that are required. OK, now let's move on to something else, which is the fact that we're obviously interested. Whoops, let's go back. No, let's go forward rather. Um, one of the things that we're very interested in with the beta adrenoceptor ligands is understanding not just how strongly they bind to the receptor, but the kinetics of them. And the reason for that is that this is a particular class of ligands. It's not the only one, 
But this is a particular class of ligands where it seems that the rates at which the ligands bind and particularly unbind from the receptor are as important in determining their pharmacological properties as their absolute binding affinity. And this is something that's becoming more and more realized for, for many classes of molecules that we always think that if all that really matters is how strongly does your ligand bind because this is thermodynamics. But the simple fact is that in most cases your body is not in thermodynamic equilibrium. I mean, if we were, we'd be basically be dead. Um, and certainly, if you're giving people drugs, say orally drugs, then there's a the levels build up and then they decay away as they metabolize. We're not in an equilibrium situation. And so, partly for those reasons, what we discover is that very often the kinetic profile of a drug binding to its targets is as important as the thermodynamic profile in determining how it behaves. So when you've got a situation like this, where the drug binding pocket is very sort of far into the sort of, you know, center of the cavity of the protein, then you can see that its journey in and out of this region is really quite a complicated one. And it's likely to encounter many kind of hurdles that it needs to overcome as it gets, goes from outside to inside. And one can imagine that if one plotted some kind of free energy diagram, for, you know, the, the, the pathway in and out is that you might well see something like this. We'd have a, a deep minimum close to the binding site here where because of those key clamp regions. Um, but the journey out is going to be passed over a number of sort of intermediate barriers before you escape. And this has been recognized for this class of ligands for quite a long time that this in theory is there, although the characterization of it has never been, been, been very easy to achieve or to be sure of. It's more a hypothesis rather than a certainty. But it does actually matter quite a lot if we are interested in the kinetics of drug binding. Because you can see that in this model, I and mean, this is a hypothetical surface, all right, we don't know it looks like this, but just imagine that it did look like this. Then what you can see basically is it, in terms of unbinding, we've got a set, set of sort of metastable states before you actually escape from the ligand. A and the rate determining step for unbinding is obviously that Hill, that mountain you pass over, which basically has the highest activation barrier. And we can see that for unbinding, the rate determining step is going to be this first one. But you can see that for binding, the highest, if you like, barrier to binding is not the same one at all. It's this one here in the middle. So in other words, the rate determining step for binding and the rate determining steps for unbinding are different. So what that means then is that Simply looking at how the molecule sits in its lichen binding site, which is basically all you can discover by crystallography, may not tell you much about some of the things which are most important for determining the kinetics of binding of these drugs to their target. So really, if we want to understand that, we've got to think of something other than just look at ever more crystal structures. So, um, this is something that you know was realized um, quite early on. Uh, and this is some data from, uh, in fact, some collaborators of ours now, although they weren't collaborators when they produced this paper, um, of a group at um, a yeah, pharmaceutical company in the UK. Uh, and they were particularly interested in this is issue because they, they did a whole load of, kin of experimental kinetic studies on a variety of different beta blockers actually binding to the beta-2 isoform of the receptor. And what they, you see is that basically the on and off rates vary over three orders of magnitude across this sort of panel of, of many of sort of useful or interesting. Some of these are actually sort of, you know, uh, drugs. Some of them are more, if you might call tool compounds. But they're, they're all sort of interesting. But you're seeing, yes, basically about three orders of magnitude variation in K-off and in K-on, and they don't correlate. That's the thing. There's very weak correlations between how, how what the K-off is and what the K-on is. And there's an awful lot of structural diversity in these molecules as well. So this kind of supports this idea that what determines K-on and what determines K-off are, are kind of different because they come from different parts of that process of binding or unbinding to the receptor. But Exactly what that is, really not clear. Well, anyway, this is all stuff that really, that really began before we were getting involved in it from a computational point of view. Um, 
The reason we got involved was uh, because of this story that I told you at the beginning about this search for selective beta-1 inhibitors. And this was a project which had been going on at, at the university for a time before we got involved with it, basically just driven by sort of chemistry, doing some chemistry and doing pharmacology, uh, and really without much thought about the actual crystal structures. Because, and in some ways maybe that was a good thing, um, what the group had done was basically take a existing ligand which was having a sniff of beta-1 selectivity and then they were also partly making but also they were looking at, at, at other companies molecules which, which, which seem to have this characteristic of maybe having some beta-1 selectivity and trying to optimize it uh, but what they were actually developing were molecules all of which had rather large, extended, non-aromatic moieties, or what we call this left-hand side. Now, if you remember, I said that the left-hand side, according to crystallography, should be small and, and aromatic. These are, well, okay, sometimes they are aromatic, but they're certainly not small, and sometimes they're not aromatic at all. And yet, these appear to be, actually, some of these, they're not going to bind into this pocket. And in fact, that one of the first things we did when we took, got involved with this project, is we started looking at these ligands, we took the crystal structures, you try to do docking into this pocket, and it just doesn't work. They won't fit. So, so what's going on then? Um, well, of course, one possibility is, well, they just, they fit in a different way around. You know, they do something different. I mean, you can make them fit, you can squish them in there, but only by, I don't know, turning them on their heads or turning them upside down or something like that. In other words, you lose all those classical interactions that should be being made between this ethanolamine function and the, and the protein that are present in all other ligands. The only way you can get these ligands into this site is if you imagine that those don't exist anymore. And that just seems sort of, sort of wrong, chemically wrong. Why should these molecules suddenly abandon the key interactions that every other molecule makes? So that didn't really seem right. Um, so, well, I'll go back one, actually. Um, if I can, that's better. So we thought, well, there's maybe what's going on here, actually, is that the crystallography is simply just not giving us a completely accurate picture of, of what the shape of this pocket can be. Um, because, if you like, nobody's really ever tried to crystallize beta adrenal septa with ligands of this sort. Uh, and I must say, we, tr we tried. Well, we tried through collaborators to do this, and we could, they couldn't get a crystal structure for us either. Um, you know, but maybe, you know, there's more opportunities here than we think. We all know that protein structures are potentially flexible, that they can change shape. Maybe what it is, actually, is there's just some way in which this pocket can change its shape such that these groups can be accommodated. Don't know where, but, you know, maybe there are all sorts of options. Maybe we can just, you know, it could get bigger somewhere. So how are you going to do that? Well, as it turns out, a few years earlier, we'd... Um, in sort of invented uh, a modeling approach based on molecular simulations to, to sort of investigate this, this problem of trying to look at what are now actually very, very interesting areas. These things called cryptic binding pockets. This is where proteins have got a little, little cavity in them that doesn't look big enough when you look at the, at the APO form, for example, of a crystal structure. It doesn't look big enough to bind any interesting ligands. But actually, it's, it's quite flexible, it's quite plastic. And in fact, it can basically expand if it could, it could open its mouth and swallow something much bigger than you would imagine that it's able to be able to. Uh, and the technique that we came up with to actually look at this, um, we called um, active site pressurization, which isn't really a very good name because it should probably just be called binding site pressurization. But we was originally thought we were to think about um, enzymes, so we called it active site, but it works equally well for receptors. And the, the sort of the concept is, is like this. Um, the concept basically is that you kind of, you can imagine you inject into the cavity, into the center of your protein, some kind of stuff. But then when it's full, you just keep pressing. So basically, you, you pressurize the inside. And so that basically, it has to go somewhere. And it, it basically, it causes an expansion in the size of the, of the cavity in the protein. And you then have something, um, I'm going to just run that again if I can. Am I going to be able to do that again? I'm going to go. Um, so yeah, this is idea. you inject something into the cavity, fill it up, 
but then you keep pressing, put even more into it, it bulges out wherever it wants to go, wherever is the path of least resistance. Then basically imagine taking that stuff out, a bit like that kind of expanding sort of foam you put in to seal up round windows. You've got a sort of bigger hole that you could perhaps then do docking in there and, and find bigger molecules that would go in there. So that was, that's, the, that's the process. And it's basically a form of molecular dynamics. So that's how we do it. Um, so we thought, well, let's see if we apply that to this beta-1 receptor, what happens? Um, so we did, and, and this is what happens. So this is the dynamics, and the little red balls are actually the stuff that we pump into it. So we, you're getting two views of this. In one of it, you're seeing a kind of, um, a sort of space-filling view of what happens as the simulation progresses. And in the other case, you're just seeing kind of what was happening within the side of the, 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 the seven helices of the, uh, of the protein. So what happens, in effect, is that it fills up that cavity in the middle, as you would expect. And then eventually, it does expand, but actually not in the way that we kind of expected to. You can see it actually bursts through the side of the protein. And in fact, we're not showing it here, but it's bursting through into what would be the intramembrane space. And actually, when you look at this picture here, it corresponds to basically puncturing a hole through the side of the protein just about here. Now, we didn't tell it where to make that hole. It could have been anywhere. It could have made this cavity bigger. It could have done something up here. It could have done something over here, but it didn't. What it did was punch a hole through the protein exactly there. And that's a bit of enormous fortune because if you take the structures that are formed basically after you've done this active site pressurization process and try and dock those long ligands that we were talking about into the structure, you discover, let's put the other one up, that they fit beautifully. Now suddenly by this long part, this left-hand side of the protein that I said, of the ligands that I said had a problem finding anywhere, that sits just beautifully along this little tunnel and we can keep all those canonical interactions between the receptor and the ligands that we expect to see. No problem at all. Everything just fits lovely. Now, this was pretty much just hypothesis when we first generated it. Um, but almost actually at the same time as, we, as we, we did this work, some crystal structures began to become available for uh, beta adrenoceptors, that indeed, if you looked closely, uh, and strangely, the, the authors of these crystal structures never, never pointed this out, but if you look closely, you could see something, at least in nascent form, this little cavity leading through from the outside of the protein through into the central receptor binding cavity. So this, but if you look at other crystal structures, it's not there at all. So it's really, you know, is it there or is it not there? Was this an artifact of the crystallization or was it real? Really hard to know. You know, this was kind of circumstantial evidence, but it's not proving that this is true at all. So we thought, well, what can we do about this? So obviously the simulations tell you so, so much, but at the end of the day, you've got to try and validate it in some way. Um, so what we did is we made molecules. So, so my colleague Salish Mistry and his team, we basically took the, the classic kind of beta blocker skeleton and just basically made this left-hand side bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And we did it in, or he did it, I should say, in, in two series of molecules, one of which we in, increased this chain length with a sort of polyether type system, sort of an aliphatic, sort of flexible polyether. And in the other case, using basically aromatic rings getting longer and longer and longer. And you know, by the conventional wisdom, people would have said, well, basically as you go down here, this gets more and more bulky, it should get worse and worse and worse at binding because it won't fit. Whereas in fact, what actually happens is in the, um, in the aliphatic series, it basically, it wobbles up and down, but basically it makes almost no difference at all. So they're all accommodated just as well as each other in terms of their binding to both beta-1 and beta-2 receptors. In the case of the aromatic derivatives, they actually become more and more potent. So um, this was really, you know, 
great for us, great supporting information. Um, doesn't prove anything still, but it gives good, a good idea that this, you know, this makes sense. So, the question then is where do we go from here? We've got a whole set of new molecules, uh, particularly these ones over on this side, that really it's difficult to imagine how they could bind to the receptor other than by using this little hole through the side, which we dubbed the keyhole, because it is, you've kind of peeped through it, just a tiny little hole, and you can see all the way into the center of the receptor. Um, so this also actually, we realized, had some other implications as well. So the classic model for how, obviously, ligands bind to receptors, and certainly how, if you like, the beta adrenoceptor antagonists bind to the beta adrenoceptor, it is the kind of picture that you're seeing here on the left. So the protein sits in the bilayer membrane. We've got a quite deeply buried bind, um, ligand binding site. We've got that channel in the vestibule leading to the extracellular space. And so ligand binding is going to be, remember we're in quite interested in kinetics and roots, is going to be a basically a, a sort of shuttling of the ligands through that, along that channel to and from the active site. And there's going to be an on rate and an off rate. And maybe it would be nice to be able to work out what those are. But what had been also been happening at, at around this time, and it actually comes back to that picture I showed you from our, our colleague Steve Charlton and, and people who basically looked at this this data here. The reason they were doing this was because they were thinking about this particular model here. If you look at many, many of these drugs, they're very, very lipophilic. I mean, the classic beta blockers are not. They're quite, uh, they're quite um, hydrophilic molecules. But a lot of these sort of modified ones are not at all. They're really, really lipophilic molecules. Certainly, and if you just basically drop them into water in the presence of a cell membrane, they're going to just partition straight into that membrane space. And the concentration of basically this drug is going to be entirely in the membrane. It's not going to be in the aqueous layer at all. So that means then, if you're thinking of trying to understand the kinetics of how these drugs bind and unbind the receptor, you've really got two kinetics to think about. You've got to think about the rate at which basically the drug is able to escape from its kind of compartment in the, in the membrane, its depot in the membrane, and then the rate for it then goes from the aqueous area into the binding site, into the, into the recognition site um, as usual. And in, in this paper, basically the sites ago, they were arguing that you had to basically take the log P or even the log D of these molecules into account and basically use it to sort of correct the kind of what you were seeing experimentally to understand the on and off rates because of this phenomenon. But of course, now what we've done is we've made it a little bit more complicated again, because now we've got this possibility, maybe, whereby in fact the ligands don't have to actually escape into the aqueous phase at all, because they perhaps by using the keyhole can shuttle directly from the membrane straight into the binding site in the receptor. And it's already known that there are certain families of G-protein coupled receptors, but not the beta adrenoceptor, that almost certainly do use this mechanism because basically their, their ligands are basically lipids. So it may be pretty silly if the lipid did anything else rather than sort of go in by something a little bit like this anyway. So this certainly makes, you know, it makes some sort of sense. But clearly then we have an even more complicated potentially complicated set of sort of kinetic parameters to try and estimate. We've got multiple possible routes that these drugs could be basically moving between different compartments, different rates, and therefore ultimately affecting their pharmacology, which is basically at the end of the day what we're interested in. So where do we go from here? Well, we really thought the first thing we needed to think about was, well, is, it, is this possible? And we set ourselves the modeling challenge of this, of asking the question, have we got any reason to believe that molecules could genuinely be able not just to use this keyhole as a place to stick a little floppy part of their, themselves, but actually could they use it as an alternative route through which they can actually enter and escape from the receptor binding site? So, the way we decided to do this was to use a methodology, second of the methodologies I'm going to tell you a little bit about, 
which is not ours, we didn't invent this one. Um, this is the weighted ensemble method. So for, for those who haven't come across it, uh, this is a, a really, it's been around for quite a long time as a enhanced sampling technique in molecular simulations. Um, it's been around here yeah, probably for 20 years, but particularly pioneered recently by um, Zuckerman and Chong. Uh, they've done a lot of work basically and really um, sort of popularized this as a method for getting by for kinetics, all sorts of kinetics from molecular simulations. And it's an interesting form of uh, enhanced sampling because in many sorts of enhanced sampling, the way in which you persuade the system to do something it doesn't really want to do is you basically bias the potential energy surface. But in this form of enhanced sampling, you don't bias the potential energy surface. What you do is you bias the sampling. In other words, an information bias rather than a energy bias and and, the, and it works like this okay so it's, it takes a little bit of if you haven't seen this before I'll, I'll try and do this relatively slowly but not too boringly imagine this is our we're looking down now at a, a, a simple potential energy surface and we can see it's got two basins in it and let's say that's the bound state that's the unbound state and maybe there's an there's a state in the middle as well um and we've these red lines show that we've sort of divided up into sort of three bins and what we've done is we've started that little black dot. That is a simulation. That is, that's, that's the structure of, a, of our a ligand. And right now it's bound in the binding site. And what we're going to do is we're going to run a molecular dynamics simulation on it. And that's going to cause us, if you like, to travel across this energy surface in some way over the course of the MD. But we don't just run one simulation on it. We run some. And let's say we're going to run, to keep it simple, we'll say we're just going to run two. So we're going to run two replicate simulations. So we do that. But what we do is we say, we basically, we kind of split the molecule in half, in the sense not of actually splitting it physically in half, but we split its importance in half. We say that this molecule has a weight of one, but we're going to run two simulations on it, and each of them has got a weight of a half. So we do that, which is why these dots, these dots here, you can see, they're half black, half white. They're, they're, they're way worth a half, half a simulation each. And what you can see is that in this particular case, one of them wiggles around a bit but stays in the first bin. As it happens, the other one has actually transitioned across and at the end of the simulation is in this central bin. So now we go up to here. So we've just, we're just zigzagging across up to here. We've got one half of weighted simulation in this first bin, one half weighted simulation in the middle bin. And then what we do is we split them because we've decided that each bin should always have two simulations in it, whatever their weight is. So we split this one into two simulations, each of a quarter of a weight, and this one into two simulations, each of which is a quarter of a weight. And again, we run molecular dynamic simulations on each of those. There they are. And let's see what's happened in this case. In this case, both of the ones that were in the original bin have actually just wiggled around in that bin, and this time they've not, neither of them has escaped. Of the ones that were in the central bin, one has indeed just stayed in the central bin, but the other one has actually wiggled all the way, its way back to the starting bin. So at the end of this second stage, we now end up with three simulations in this bin, first bin, one in the second bin. Okay, the one in the second bin, we... We do what we always do. We have to split it in half because we want two simulations each bin. Oh, what do we do here? Well, we've got three. We've got too many. Well, the opposite of splitting is merging. What happens is we basically sacrifice one of these three simulations and then basically transfer the sacrificed weight onto the two remaining simulations. So they've now worth well, whatever it is, a quarter plus an eighth each each. And now we've got two simulations in each bin, and then we run some more simulations, two each, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what happens basically when this particular case is at the last point, we finally got a simulation which has reached the, the, the target state, the unbound state. But by this time, it's only worth an eighth or a sixteenth of a simulation. But a, short, short, a small amount of simulation has got over the R energy barrier. Okay, so that's basically how weighted ensembles work. Um, so another way of sort of looking at it a little bit is that if you imagine that you've got, you can think in terms of flux, 
of weight of simulation moving from bin to bin to bin to bin from your starting bin to your ending bin and typically what happens if you like that flux is decreasing as you go all the way across until a tiny bit eventually trickles into that last bin now there are different ways of doing weighted ensemble simulations but if you're interested in kinetics the classic way to do it is what's called steady state mode and what happens in this is that any simulations that finally get to this last bin are immediately recycled. They pass outside the system and are basically deposited back in the first bin again. And what you measure is the flux, the weight, which is being recycled back to that starting bin. And this recycled flux is the thing from which you calculate your rate of, of transitioning from start to end. So if you want to see a, a much better description of it than that, there's a nice little review there from, from Dan Zuckerman and, and Lillian Chong uh, that explains in much more detail how it does. And there are, there are lots of, of different ways to do it, but this is the, the key thing, that you have a whole set of bins, you've got different weights, but it's this recycling of weight from the, spot, from the end to the start, that's what you measure, and that trickle of, of weight is, is your your flux and your what you get your kinetics from. Okay, um, so what you're going to do, in effect, if you like, is, you, is you're going to try and you're going to set a whole series of bins up, which basically are going to take you from that bound state deep in the in the center of the of the protein all the way out. Um, so if you actually, by a method which I'm going to talk to you about in a minute, actually sort of produce a simulation that does that. Um, what you discover, of course, is that it do, the, this molecule does not move in a straight line. So the question then is, how are you going to divide up your space along the pathway from the bound state to the unbound state into little bins that you can then basically do sampling between in your, in your weighted ensemble method? And indeed, if you, do, if, you ca if you generate a sort of rough unbinding pathway, and then look at it in terms of its sort of coordinates, what you find is that it is, it is a one-dimensional path in a sense, but it's through a multi-dimensional space. So this is just a principal component analysis, basically, of the, of the unbinding pathway. And what you can see is, is this is what this unbinding pathway looks like. And you can see that at different times, it has to move in very different ways in order to get from the inside to the outside. So, this is a problem which comes with a lot of enhanced sampling methods, is how do you describe the reaction coordinate or the progress coordinate that you need to sample over to get from your start, first state of interest to your last. But there are quite a lot of problems where you have this rather useful characteristic that although the pathway exists in a high, relatively high dimensional space, in this case, say, three significant dimensions, in fact, the pathway itself is a kind of is a one-dimensional thing through that higher dimensional space. And when you've got this situation, it's quite useful because there are some methods out there that allow you to, to really turn what ought to be a multi-dimensional problem into a one-dimensional problem, and that's these so-called sort of string methods. So um, this is what we, we basically do. What you do is you, you generate a, you take a rough pathway, and you can then simplify out of it, you can calculate a set of points, which if you like are a shortest direct path that will get you out of there. And then you use these points, which kind of are scattered along this pathway to define your kind of, it's almost like a spline curve, which passes through it. And it's then motion effectively along this pathway, which defines your reaction coordinate. And in fact, this method, there's, there's lots of variations of this approach. Um, the one which is perhaps best known is a thing called path collective variables. And it's quite nice. It's the method used in metadynamic simulations quite a lot. Uh, it's sort of statistically sound. But actually, as the authors themselves cheerfully admit in their papers, it's a, it's a horrible thing to actually try and make to work. Because it, it actually, if you do it the way they, they want you to do it, then all these little guide points along this pathway have to be exactly the same distance apart from each other. And apparently, it can sometimes take you years to have generated those 
just so that you can run your sort of two-week uh, metadynamic simulation, which is a bit silly. So we came up with a slightly more approximate approach. It does the same job, but it has the great advantage that it doesn't actually require that these kind of uh, guide points are actually exactly the same distance apart from each other. But that's, that's the approach. Um, so how did I, we actually generate this pathway to start with? Since I said, in, you know, we, we have to have that before we can do the weighted ensemble simulation. So again, this is our third enhanced sampling method I want to tell you about, which again, is, this one is, is due to us as well. And this is a thing that we call um, self-avoiding walk molecular dynamics. And it's basically like this. Um, so actually, I, I did, these are in the wrong way order. Just, just look on the one on the left. Just forget about that one for a moment. The one on the left. This is just a random walk on a two-dimensional lattice, all right? No bias, no nothing. And what's happening is a, a, a molecule, whatever it is, is just moving over this surface completely at random. And you'll notice that occasionally the, the dots turn from blue to yellow. And, and the, a block a dot is yellow if it's more than a certain distance from any other yellow dot. So what basically happens is as the, as the simulation, we call it a simulation, progresses, as the, the thing wanders away from where it's been before, eventually it gets a long way from a previous yellow dot and it becomes another yellow dot. And then it moves a bit further and it becomes another yellow dot. The other thing that you'll notice is that the yellow dots have different sizes. And that's because the, the radius of each, that dot is, is proportional to the number of blue dots around it, which are closer to it than to any other yellow dot. Now, what's happening in the one on the right is we're doing the same thing. We're starting off a simulation as a point. We're doing a random walk through space. We're putting down these little yellow dots every time we get more than a certain distance from any previous yellow dot. But the difference in this one is that then each of these little yellow dots basically has a repulsive force field around it that's repelling the system away from it. And the strength with which it repels it increases if, it, if you like, the system refuses to move away from it. So the, lo the more time that the, the system spends close to each of those yellow dots, the bigger that yellow dot grows and the greater the repulsive potential that it's pushing it away. And what you find when you do that, not surprisingly, is this is dissuading this molecule from going back onto itself. It doesn't stop it entirely, but it basically says, if you've been here before, then don't bother coming back and coming here again. So what happens then is inevitably, is you get much more efficient sampling of conformational space because you tend not to go back to places you visited before. And what you can see, you're probably saying, well, hang on, isn't this like, just like something I've seen quite a lot of? which is exactly how metadynamics works? And the answer is yes, it is in some respects. Remember, metadynamics has this idea that you basically penalize a molecule for going into a state it's seen before by putting in these little Gaussians that add up to energies that repel it, and eventually it goes to new places it's never been before. And you're right, there's an enormous, we were totally inspired by metadynamics in putting this together, but there's a big difference. This thing along the bottom here is, a, is one of those dratted reaction coordinates or progress coordinates, which is so difficult to define. And you need to have one of these before you can do metadynamics. But when you're doing self-avoided walk, you don't have a progress coordinate. You don't need one. That's the rather nice thing. That basically it sorts out its own progress coordinate for itself as the simulation progresses. But what you can do once you've allowed a rough simulation, and there's nothing exact, unlike metadynamics, there's nothing exact about self-avoiding walk. It's a very crude approach. But it gives you potentially, for example, an unbinding pathway, which you from, then, from which you can then get one of these nice progress coordinates so that you can do something much more statistically valid, like, in our case, not metadynamics, but a weighted ensemble simulation. So, um, Yes, so the self-avoiding walk part, uh, we put that together in OpenMM. Uh, so yeah, we've had Amber and Gromax and things like that today, but this was OpenMM. And the reason we did that is that, if, for those who haven't used OpenMM, is that it's basically Python. It's basically MD in Python. Uh, 
And, and, and this obviously needed quite a bit of scripting. You weren't going to just make a, a standard out of the box a molecular dynamics simulation program do self-avoiding walk without basically getting into an awful lot of code and hacking it apart and putting it back together again. But the great thing about new codes like OpenMM is it's very easy to take them as a basis and write all sorts of funky new enhanced sampling methods around them. It's a very simple method. It is really basically three user-defined parameters. Um, which atoms to use for the RMSD calculation, which says basically if it's moved far enough away from where it was before, such that it qualifies as another of these sort of yellow dots. The question, yes, about how far that distance is, how far is it before a, a yellow dot it needs to be put down again? And also then the rate at which you basically, those hills grow, how much that repulsive force increases if the molecule refuses to, to move away from where it's been hanging around far too long. So there aren't many, and they're, they're basically very similar variables to the ones that have used in metadynamics as well. So that's the system, and um, well, as you can see on the basis, it works. Um, you can see it basically shows you, you can put the molecule in here, give it a start, the, the, the self-avoiding walk MD, and it will dissociate. And I can tell you that if you weren't using self-avoiding walk, if this was a, a, a conventional uh, unbiased simulation, you, you would be here for a thousand years before you ever saw that ligand disappear from that binding site. So, um, the methodology had been put together before we'd really um, thought of applying it to this particular problem, but this was an obvious good use for it. Um, so this was Kevin's, um, he basically helped to, to, certainly to refine this method, and he certainly was the first person to apply it to these kinds of systems. So we took one of our, our longest ligands, the ones which we knew basically had no chance really of, uh, of fitting into the protein by anything other than using some form of extra pocket, um, and he performed, in fact, because they take a bit of effort, be six simulations in total, both begun from a dot conformation in the, the, the structure. I should say these simulations were all atom simulations done with um, open MM, membrane here, which you're not seeing, aqueous layer, ions, the whole lot, all atomistic. And what happened was basically he ran it six times. In three of the times, the molecule decided to scoot out through the vestibule sorry, the vestibule, which is the conventional route up the top there, but three times it decided to basically scoot out through the keyhole. Uh, so that was really interesting. I mean, but the thing is you have to take it with a pinch of salt because we know that this is an approximate method. It doesn't prove that the two things are exactly equal in likelihood, but at least what we have is we have pathways from which we can generate these one-dimensional string type progress coordinates that we can then apply in a weighted ensemble simulation that will give us much more believable results as to whether these pathways are equally likely and equally energetic. Um, I think, yes, here is an example actually of one of these, these actually pathways. And whoop, there it goes, squirted, basically squirted out of the side of the protein. So that's the sort of thing that you get when you do these simulations. Right. Um, Back to weighted ensemble simulations. Remember, that's where to go. Yeah, to go next. This is where you get the real good quality um, predictions of binding or unbinding kinetics. Um, they're based, as you see, on that method of splitting, merging, lots of simulations. You run a lot, a lot, maybe tens of thousands of short molecular dynamic simulations when you're doing weighted ensemble. And they're all simple, unbiased MD simulations, but there's you know large numbers of them. And there's no way you can do that unless you've got some form of automation to help you do all this process. Now, it's not something that's built into any of the standard MD codes, Amber, Gromax, whatever it is, that none of these can do weighted ensemble out of the box. You've got to do something with it. So in fact, um, uh, Dan Zuckerman and, and Lillian Chong have a, a nice package called WESPA, which does uh, weighted ensemble simulations. Um, it's been around for a bit. I mean, it's not bad. It's got it's Python based, a bit like the R Saw MD thing. Or it's got a, a good base, uh, good support. They've written some nice tutorials on how to to do it, uh, and some really good analysis tools. Unfortunately, though, the code is really very chewy. Um, and although it's fine if you just want to do pretty much what they've designed it to do, it's not easy if you want to do something a bit different. And in particular, it isn't particularly well suited or 
easy to use on high performance computing facilities. So in fact, again, we've been working for a time on a, a generic Python based uh, workflow system for molecular simulations, a thing called Crossflow, which I'm, I haven't got time to tell you about today, but um, is, is, is something that's really, we find incredibly useful. Uh, and, and so we decided to implement weighted ensemble in, in Crossflow. And as I say, Crossflow is just a very generic Python package for writing workflows. And what it allows you to do is to just basically stick together lots and lots of different tools and make them all talk to each other. And you can run them on the cloud, and you can run them on HPC, you can run them on Condor clusters, you can run them on your Mac, uh, anywhere, without really changing anything. You change the code, which is quite nice. Uh, it was particularly designed, it, came, it grew out of a, a cloud computing project that we were involved with. Um, but we found, in fact, you can use it. It doesn't have to be on the cloud at all. But it's designed specifically for high throughput computing on distributed architectures. And that is exactly the kind of thing that weighted ensemble simulations needs. Uh, and it proved that we, we were able to put something together very easily to do it. Because actually, weighted ensemble isn't a very complex idea. It's just putting it all, gluing all the bits together can be hard. The crossflow made it not too hard for us at all. Um, so this was the plan. This, this, was, this was Kevin's plan. Um, first of all, you saw MD, and then basically that'll hopefully push the ligands out through both channels, if it does. Maybe it won't. Maybe when we apply it to some of the ligands we want to study, they'll only go out one way or the other, but whatever. We'll get some pathways, some rough pathways using SOMD. And then we'll study each of the two routes individually by weighted ensemble. And we'll start with the conventional route via, that goes via the vestibule, this one up here. And we'll define, remember these are weighted ensemble simulations, so we'll define the start bin as being the bound state. The last bin will be the unbound state. And then we'll run one of these steady state weighted on, ensemble simulations and gradually, basically, weight will percolate up out of here and then be recycled out at the beginning, and then it'll chug out again and go back. And we'll measure that recycling rate, and that will basically allow us to calculate the off rate along this way. And then, basically, we'll reverse it. We'll make this the first state. We'll make this the last state. And again, we'll run some simulations, weighted on some simulations going the other way. And that's the, the slightly awkward, you think, do you really have to run simulations, separate simulations in both directions to get these two different kinetics? Unfortunately, using this particular way of doing weighted ensemble, this so-called steady state, you do. There are ways, in theory, you can do it in one simulation, but they're almost as, they're, in fact, they're as costly and just more complicated. So there's no advantage to not doing it. So you basically almost run the weighted ensemble simulation twice, once forward and once backward, and you get the kinetics for each leg from each of those simulations. And then basically once that, just do the same thing again, looking at first the off rate and then the on rate on the keyhole route, and then basically look at the kinetics and compare what we got and see if it kind of fits anything like the sort of model, the conceptual model that we had for the process at the beginning. Okay, so that was the plan, and it ran into problems immediately. Because what we discovered was that it's almost entirely impossible to persuade using weighted ensembles to get the bound state to unbind. And the reason for that is that this, basically this valley here, this minima, is incredibly steep. And it just turns out that certainly in our hands, despite, well, Kevin's hands, despite him beating his head against a brick wall, because I wouldn't let him not beat his head against a brick wall for about six months, um, he couldn't find a way to make it work. It simply wouldn't unbind. It just, it just wouldn't work. All right, does that mean we're completely stuck? No, as he pointed out very cleverly, it doesn't mean that at all. He said, well, hang on a minute, we've got our, our, we've got our collaborators, we've got our pharmacologists. So we already know what the binding constant for these are. So we know what KD is. So what that means is that we don't need to actually computationally calculate both K on and K off because the ratio of K on to K off is the equilibrium binding constant. So if we know the equilibrium binding constant, we can, for instance, supposing we can calculate K on, then we basically divide one by the other, and we've got K off anyway. We don't need to actually simulate, calculate both of them. So that was the process, the idea. Let's just look at the entry routes. Don't try and calculate going off. 
just look at the on process. And it turns out that that is perfectly straightforward to do. The barriers, it's not so much that they're not so high, but they're simply just not so steep. And so the weighted ensemble method works really quite very nicely for that. And you can calculate on rates without much problem. So that's exactly what Kev was planning to do for both entry of the ligand into the binding site through the conventional route and entry basically from the intramembrane space. And again, we'll have two predicted K-ons. We've got experimental KDs, so therefore we can calculate the missing K-off that we couldn't get by weighted ensemble. Okay, well that's all the plan. The question is we've got to validate this in some way. So how can we do that? Not easy because there's not a lot of data for beta one and there's certainly no data for our ligands because we'd only just made them. Kinetics data, I should say. But what there was, was data fortunately for bisoprolol, which is certainly got a fairly long wiggly chain there, not so far different from our molecules, uh, at beta two. And uh, this is uh, some of the work that was done by uh, Steve Charlton and his group back in 2014. So in fact, this is the K-off and the K-on that they measured experimentally and, and the ratio of the two, the, uh, the KD. So you can see that the, these, these unbind slowly. Look, that's a, a K-off of six per minute. That is, you know, these things are stuck like superglue. So that was the experimental uh, method measure. Uh, this at the bottom here, this is what Kev got. So he basically, again, he starts off looking at beta two, not beta one, because that was what we've been studied experimentally. The experimental ligand, bisoprolol, not our ligand. This was what he actually got by weighted ensemble simulation. That's what was in the literature. We, 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 we were a bit anal. What we also did actually is we recalculated ourselves ph pharmacologically what the equilibrium binding constant was for this system. And so on the basis, again, of the ratio of these two, we have a calculated value for K-off. What you can see is that's the number that actually came out of the weighted ensemble simulation. That was a difference between a previous experimental determination of KD done by another group and Gillian Baker's calculation in-house of ours of the KD. And that, if you like, is the difference it makes to the K off. You can see really, okay, a little bit different, but not bad, eh? I think, you know, most of the difference, if you like, in K offs seems to come, in fact, from the fact that there's a rather different prediction about what the KD is, which weren't us, that was the pharmacologists. So I think we were pretty happy with that. So then we turned our attention to our, our lead molecule. And just to cut a long story short, here are the numbers. Obviously, the KD is the same because it's the same ligand binding to the same receptor. These are the predicted K-offs and K-ons. So this is basically what was measured in the weighted ensemble simulation. And you can see basically those numbers are almost exactly the same. So, you know, let's not quibble really. What this is saying is that the simulations predict that it's just as easy for these molecules to slip in and out of the receptor through that keyhole as it is to wiggle the way all the way up and down through the vestibule channel to get out of the protein. Um, which was, we were quite surprised at. We did not think that was going to be the case, I'll be honest with you. We thought that it might sort of partially compete by an order of, you know, a tenth, a hundredth maybe. It, it just looked really quite a small channel and whatever, but no, it comes out just as well. So, what does that mean? Well, it's, you know, this is where we are at about today, actually. I'm telling you, I'm bringing you pretty much up to date with this project. Um, because it says, really, if you think about all these models, that it says that life could be complicated for these beta blocker ligands. Because it may well, exactly how they bind and unbind from the beta adrenoceptor may depend on all sorts of things. It may, first of all, it may depend they may not all use the same method to get in and out. Some may prefer to go in and out through the vestibule. Some may prefer to go in and out through the membrane. What's going to affect that? Well, 
partly it might be their lipophilicity. Bisoprolol, relatively lipophilic, likely to have a much higher concentration in the aqueous layer, may be much more likely to go in and out through the conventional route. We certainly never have saw in our weighted ensemble simulations any evidence that it wanted to go the other way. Much more lipophilic ligands, such as the ones that we've been dealing with, perhaps are much more likely to go in and out through the membrane route. But other things could change this. Perhaps if the you know, other parts of this molecule were more or less bulky, then lipophilicity wouldn't be the controlling influence. It would be the question of like how constricted some of the sort of pathways were in, sort of in between the entrance and the getting to the active sites, getting to the receptor site along each of these different routes. Other things could affect it. It could be a balance of structural features and lipophilicity features. It could be complicated. So that's where we are really at the moment. I mean, so what, where are we at? First of all, our active site pressurization method has told us really that these beta adrenoceptors are much more plastic than you'd think by just looking at the crystal structures. Secondly, that these predicted changes, you know, openings up are not just probably, you know, artifacts of, of doing some weird sorts of strange simulations. It really makes sense. It makes sense because we're beginning to actually see them in crystal structures that are being deposited. And because it's the only way, basically, that you could explain the pharmacology of, of new classes of ligands, which we've designed based on, you know, assuming that this method, sorry, assuming that this structure is, is, is possible. Um, we've got, a, what we find is really a quite a useful new method for quickly to, to, to looking at sort of approximate off rates or pathways anyway, this self-avoiding walk MD. And we're finding a number of new uses for that as well, and it seems to be quite a useful method. And the nice thing is we found a way that we can then link that to weighted ensemble methods to allow us to look at really complicated unbinding pathways and actually get hopefully quite accurate, or at least no reason why they wouldn't be any less accurate than any other computational technique, accurate method, uh, kinetics for ligand unbinding and binding along complicated, snaky, deep pathways. But to be frank, it's still not straightforward. A very slow rate, remember we're talking about rates of a few per minute, it's still challenging to use this weighted ensemble method to get these rates. Whether it's possible, maybe we just need to work at it, I don't know, we'll, we'll see. Um, but certainly it looks as though we, we could have basically a new sort of paradigm for how these ligands bind to these receptors. And that could have some real implication. You know, what it says really is that there could be really different structure kinetic relationships amongst these families of ligands, depending on aspects of their structure that people never really thought about before, in particular the best balance between their lipophilicity and their kind of steric bulk. Uh, the two sometimes go hand in hand, but they don't have to. And this could really complicate the picture of understanding the pharmacology. Um, there are still many things we, we haven't even begun to get our hands on yet. You know, what about beta-2? And we know that beta-2 is significantly different in both the vestibule regions and to a lesser extent, but to some extent, in the keyhole region as well. Interesting, in the keyhole region, it seems to be, it's less obvious why it's different. We see it's different in terms of the way that molecules want to go in and out that way. If you look at the, at the sequence, you'd say they ought to be behaving the same, but they don't. We don't really quite understand why that is yet. Is this a route to, remember, this is all at the beginning, supposed to be about subtype selective ligands. Is this actually a route to subtype selective ligands? We, we kind of slightly got veered off course because we found all this extra interesting stuff. We don't know. It, it could be. But, I mean, I, I think that the jury's out. It's not obvious that the keyhole actually is going to give us selectivity. But maybe it will. But interestingly, is this phenomenon observed in other GPCRs? And the answer is actually it is. We, we know that. We're actually looking at a, at a whole slew of other GPCRs that also have this kind of cryptic extra channel through which ligands protect, can potentially enter and exit um, the site. And actually, for a couple of others, we, we're, we're being caught up. Other people have seen this, and, and we're seeing other people report on, on, the, on the existence and use of these channels. And um, yes, to be continued. I think I'll leave it there. So thank you very much.
Oh yeah, of course, no, yeah. Oh yeah. You have a, yeah. So the idea is first you uh, generate the path by self-avoiding, uh, and then you do the weighted ensemble. Now, does your path depends on how much repulsion you're putting in the self-avoiding path? So you take into that account as well. Yeah, that, that's a really interesting point because you're right. In in some ways, well, this I, I could take your point at two levels. One is. Um, you know, obviously you, you can do this, the, the self-avoiding walk, and you could put a different amounts of energy into the thing. And so you could imagine that it's a bit like any other sort of pulling thing. You know, if you rip the thing out with a massive force, you get a, it happens very quickly, but the path where you get is probably really uh, unrealistic. If, you tr if you're a little bit more gentle, you might get something that you believe is a bit more realistic, but it might take you too long and you might get bored waiting for it to happen. Have we really investigated how sensitive the pathways we get are to pr the parameters that we use in these MD simulations? No, not yet. It's something we need to do. Um, uh, but, but we need to do that. The other thing, though, that, that you, perhaps you th also think of is the fact that, as you say, a bit like metadynamics, we are getting some information from the SOAR MD pathway. You know, it's not just that we get a series of points, but remember, each of these points has a kind of weight. It has this sort of repulsive field around it that tells us something about, about in fact, the sort of the free energy or, you know, in that region of space in some rough way. Uh, and although we haven't really tried to extract anything meaning from it yet, simply because we don't really have enough data to do that, to make correlations, it may well be, in fact, that we can get at least an approximation to actually kinetics using SOIMD, which we never thought we would do at the start, but it's just possible that it's there. But certainly this idea of, of just, you know, how rough and ready are these, uh, these routes and how reproducible are they, I don't know. I can say they are definitely better than the ones you tend to get using some other techniques that we've looked at. So, hopefully. Yeah, so um, I think in a metadynamics, if you use a CV of distance and where you have a site wherever your binding site is similar on that area. And if you are putting a distance which is in the water, let's say you have a large enough box, you have one point at the binding site or nearby binding site, and you have a distance which is, you know, outside the protein, let's say in the water phase. It can, you know, and then you run metadynamics, several trajectories, let's say, you know, 10, 20, 50. You, you can probabilistically weight those as well and get a fair bit of information about the pathways that which path it will take to unbind from and also the minima where is the minima there so uh, how different is this approach from the approach i have just described to you we have just written a paper very recent paper i'll share with you the same approach that we have done here right that that sounds odd, but yes please do um you're right, you, you can, this can be done by metadynamics. So in fact, we partly got into to our approach. We started off trying to use, um, indeed, metadynamics. We, um, I don't know if you know the work, some work with Francesco Gervasio at, at UCL, and he's actually used metadynamics to actually look exactly at the binding of, of, of other ligands to beta 2 and other G protein couple receptors with, with, in his hands, pretty good results. But again, his, what he has to do to create these, these pathways that work is insanely complex. He has these weird fuddle potentials that sort of have a sort of cylinder that goes halfway out of the protein and then turns into a sort of cone-shaped thing at the top, and all sorts of correction factors that he has to apply. In order. And it, it's insanely complicated. And, uh, and actually, from talking to, you know, to some of his group and things like that, it doesn't even always work anyway. Uh, and you know, and it was one of these things where they, it took them two years to come up with the with the sort of boundary conditions that then allowed them to do their metadynamics. And, and we've got two different routes to try and look at as well, we, to try and distinguish between. I mean, you're right, there's always more than one way to do these things. And you're right, uh, uh, the correct choice of collective variables would probably enable you to do this with just a straight metadynamics method. The problem is what the hell are those, what are those correct set of collective variables? <laughs> 
And what we've just tried to do here is come up with a way using effectively the path collective variable approach of, of just kind of hopefully more quickly and more reproducibly and more consistently coming up with a method for getting these pathways that ought to be applicable to studying any unbinding from any, any protein site. But you're right, there's, there are always more than one way to do these things. That's definitely true, yeah. So, but finally, when you are looking at the KD value or K on and K off and all, it finally depends on the global minima, the binding of that. doesn't depend too much on other minimas it is passing through, isn't it? Means if the project has a target of finding the global minima and the binding coefficients, then most probably other methods would also, and you know, very cheap methods also could help, right? isn't it? Means what's your comment here? Yes, you're absolutely right. At equilibrium, at equilibrium, all that matters is the relative free energy of the bound and the free state. Nothing in between, however complicated, has any effect on it. At equilibrium, but as we know, very often in reality, in pharmacological situations, we're not at equilibrium. And so therefore, understanding where, where the pinch points are, the binding and unbinding, end up being actually significant for what actually the, the pharmacological profile of your molecule is. And they certainly allow you to see where potentially they are, where these pinch points are, and how they might vary between one class of ligands and another, which you know appear on the surface to be similar to each other, but turn out to actually to be different. So that's it. You're absolutely right. We have to be careful here not to claim it's something that it isn't. You're right. At equilibrium, all this would be irrelevant. But we're not at equilibrium. Yeah. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Uh, one of the project we are looking at is the elongation of spike protein from any, any viral spike protein from its normal form when it's attached. And I was wondering, like, you know, I always think, like, how to do that. It's just, I was wondering if self-avoiding can be done. It's the problem will be how do you define the, uh, how do you define self in a protein? Easier to define, it, I guess, for a ligand, right? And you're trying to. Well, it, it could work. I mean, it probably wasn't that, because it is complicated, and I had to go through it a little bit quickly, but you see that the way that the, the self-avoiding work, work works is that you start off with, a, with the system in a state, and then it moves, and, and when we say it moves, what we really say is that its RMSD from where it started has increased. And then eventually that RMSD has increased to something, and we say, oh, that's a long way away, and this becomes a new, one of these guide points. And then it moves again, and we're, then we calculate its RMSD from both of the points. And uh, so, in fact, these distances we're talking about, these motions, these are all movements in RMSD space. So actually, you don't have to have, you don't have to think about things as distances or movements. You just have a collection of atoms, and you say, I want to see this collection of atoms be in a different conformation from what they are now, and self-avoiding walk will allow you to do that. So it could work. Perhaps we should have a go. Home time, I think, isn't it? Good stuff. Thanks all. Thanks very much.